Confluence, the flowing together of diverse cultures, is a concept created by Zhou Wenzhong, which describes the essence of his musical expression. It also refers to his aspiration for the future of civilization. Composer, educator, and cultural ambassador, Zhou Wenzhong has played a wide range of roles in his life. Crossing cultures is inherent in all he does. He arrived in the United States in 1946 and became the first composer from China to attain recognition in the West. His compositions have been performed by leading orchestras and chamber ensembles around the world. His philosophy and unique canon of works have influenced a whole generation of composers from China and post-colonial societies. As a cultural ambassador, he has brought together artists and scholars from around the world to celebrate their shared humanity and to inspire new streams of creativity. Zhou Wenzhong identifies with the traditional Chinese Wenren, or Man of the Arts, upon whom destiny has bestowed the responsibility to move society forward to a better future. Uh, and of course, it's important to realize that the real power behind a society it's not really the senator from this state or the representative from the city. It's not a big corporate uh, executive CEOs. It's the people behind the culture, the people who can drive the society forward. Uh, and in the Confucianist view, the people who can drive the society forward for the better. And that's what we need. Zhou Wenzhong was born in 1923 in Yantai in northeast China. His family lived in treaty port cities with foreign concessions, Qingdao, Shanghai, Wuhan, and Nanjing. Here, he had frequent exposure to people from Europe, their food, language, and music. He did not view things in terms of East or West. His grandfather wrote about Western civilization and published Chinese translations of Western literary classics, which Zhou read as a child. The Zhou family originated in Changzhou in Jiangsu province. His father began his career as the headmaster of a traditional elementary school. He taught poetry and literature, and was well versed in the Yijing. In 1911, he took part in the revolution to overthrow the Qing dynasty. He was honored in Shanghai, in 1989 as one of the two surviving veterans of that movement. His mother was from Jiaxing in Zhejiang, where she was known as a great beauty. Zhou was the third child in a family of seven. He was born with a serious heart condition and was a frail child, often bedridden and twice nearing the edge of death. Because of his poor health, his parents kept him home from school until the age of 12. He had an unusual education, his father supervised his studies in calligraphy, poetry, and literature. Unlike his brothers and sisters, he had free time to observe passing clouds and the world around him. When he was nine years old, he began to study the violin with his older brother Wenqing. He developed a passion for music and later taught himself to play the mandolin, arhu, harmonica, and other instruments. When his family moved to Nanjing in 1932, he entered the Jingling Middle School, a missionary school where English was taught. In 1937, the Japanese army moved south in a ruthless campaign to occupy all of China. The Zhou family fled to Shanghai, 
seeking safety in the heavily guarded international settlement. When the Japanese army penetrated with biological warfare, his brother, Wen Ho, died of typhoid. Music was the only solace for the young Wen Zhong. He began to dream about becoming a composer. He entered St. John's University in 1941 and began studies in engineering. But at the end of the year, the Japanese army marched into the settlement. Joe's family urged him to flee to avoid conscription by the Japanese. Violin in hand, he trekked on foot across hundreds of kilometers, constantly in danger of being captured. He was on the move for more than two years until he finally reached the wartime capital in Chongqing. He enrolled in the university there and completed his degree in civil engineering. When the war ended, Zhou Wenzhong returned to Shanghai to be reunited with his family. He had been away for four years. The horrors of war would haunt him for the rest of his life. I think nobody can completely forget your past. And your past lives with you. Because this is something you cannot deny, you cannot push away. It's in you. The war had taken a heavy toll on Zhou Wenzhong. His parents encouraged him to go abroad and study. Despite his devotion to music, he felt duty-bound to choose a more practical field. He had read that British art critic John Ruskin had described architecture as frozen music. Yale University School of Architecture accepted his application and offered him a full five-year scholarship. On the long journey across the ocean from Shanghai to America, Zhou had time to think about his past and future. Witnessing atrocities and suffering during the war had given him courage and a new sense of purpose. Joe arrived at Yale University in New Haven in the late summer of 1946. He met with the Dean of Architecture and told him, apologetically, that he would have to decline the scholarship offer. He had decided to study music instead of architecture. At first, the Dean was dumbfounded, and then he became furious. But he was unable to persuade the young man to change his mind. Joe then had to break the news to his family. To his enormous surprise and relief, he received a letter from his father granting his approval and his blessing. That autumn, the New England Conservatory in Boston opened its doors for the first time since the war began. Joe was accepted as a violin major and entered that very semester. He was the only student from China. He soon began studies with Russian-born composer and conductor Nicholas Slonimsky. Slonimsky was Joe's first mentor. He explained to his new student that if he really wanted to become a composer, he should first learn more about the music of his own Chinese culture. In a music history class at New England Conservatory, Joe heard the music of Edgar Varese for the first time. He was shocked by what sounded to him like pigs being slaughtered. But he was fascinated. He could not forget the sounds he had heard that day. In 1949, at the age of 26, Joe moved to New York to live with his brother. He arrived at an exhilarating moment in American cultural history. A burst of innovation in the New York art scene mixed with an influx of artists from Europe to create an atmosphere of excitement and possibilities. Joe began to study at first with the prolific Czech composer Boislav Martinu, but could not adapt to his teaching style. By chance, he met American composer Colin McPhee, who had been a student of Edgar Varese years earlier. McPhee offered to make an introduction to Varese with a warning about the composer's terrible temper. Varese's reputation was notorious. His jarring music shocked audiences, driving them into states of rage. When his early works premiered in the 1920s, fighting often broke out in the audience and the police had to be called in.
Edgar Varese was born in France in 1883 and had come to the United States in 1915. Like Zhou Wenzhong, he had a background in engineering. He called music organized sound. He experienced sounds as living entities, which he thought should be liberated. Zhou studied with Varese from 1949 to 1954. The maestro refused payment for his teaching, and Joe reciprocated by working as his copyist and assistant. During that period, Varez was working on Désaire, his most important work. The manuscript of Désaire, as well as seven other works by Varez, are written in the handwriting of Zhou Wenzhong. As a teacher, Varez focused on helping the student to find his own musical voice. He was outraged by any trace of imitation or copying. He expected the most from his students, and was brutally honest. Varese is was really an exceptional person. Uh, he never hides himself, and uh, if you, he, he's angry, with, he you make a mistake, he's angry, and he just is will say any kind of full word. <laughs> uh, and uh, on the other hand, he's sincere. He's honest. He immediately point to that. What is that? And he knew. <laughs> so students either would cry and go home, <laughs> you know, or try to say, yes, master, I'll try to, I won't say anything. Until he said, okay, um, take this out to the garden. I said, what for? They piss on it. <laughs> and I said, go ahead. Like that. Now, you have to be what I regard as artist temperament as a student to indulge in that, to say to say to oneself, well that means he's really concerned about it. Over time, the master apprentice relationship developed into a warm friendship of mutual respect. After Varez died in 1965, Joe became his music executor, and also edited and completed several of his works. To promote the legacy of his mentor, he also organized performances and lectures, and collaborated on a recording of Varese's entire canon of work. While studying with Varese, Joe entered a master's degree program at Columbia University. He studied under composer Otto Luning, who was an early pioneer of electronic music. Joe also worked as the first assistant of Columbia's new Electronic Music Center, founded by Luning and composer Vladimir Usachevsky. After completing his degree, he obtained a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to conduct research for two years on the ancient music of the Chinese zither, or qin. Joe's creative output was prolific during this period. His first work, Landscapes, completed in 1949, was premiered by the San Francisco Orchestra and conducted by Leopold Stokowski in 1953. A major breakthrough came in 1954 when the Louisville Orchestra in Kentucky commissioned him to write a piece. The orchestra had launched an extraordinary project commissioning new music from composers around the world. Joe composed And the Fallen Petals for Orchestra, which has since become his most performed work. When I went to Louisville, I walked in, met Robert Whitney. It was an empty hall, and uh, you know, right away, it was a very unusual kind of sight with the orchestra uh, on the stage. And then it began to play, and I just got lost. Then it stopped playing, and 
I still remember his look turning around. He said, what do you think? I was silent for a while. Finally, I said, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Play it again. And then he went back and played it again very patiently. I remember when I got the commission, I began to think of my own personal experience in China. Uh, and so I decided to write End of Fallen Petals. Uh, but Petals, I was thinking of my classmates, young people I knew who died in the Second World War. During this period, Zhou's personal life also blossomed. He met the acclaimed concert pianist Zhang Yian, a young musical sensation while still in high school. Zhang made her concert debut with the Hollywood Bowl Symphony, conducted by Leopold Stokowski. The couple were married in 1962. Their two sons, Lu Yen and Su Min, grew up in Varese's house in Greenwich Village, which Joe had bought from the composer's wife, Louise. Joe Wenzhong joined the faculty of Columbia University in 1964. During an academic career of three decades, his work had a significant impact on the field of arts education in the United States. He continued to bridge East and West, teaching Columbia's first course in Chinese music and introducing a new program of Asian humanities. He began the first doctoral program in composition and supervised countless numbers of emerging young composers. He taught an increasingly international body of students, some of whom have become accomplished composers in China. In addition to teaching, Joe took on many administrative duties. He often handled challenges previously unknown in academic life. The 1960s was a time of great social turbulence in America. In 1968, students at Columbia University went on strike and organized protests against the Vietnam War. Despite the demands on his time, Zhou Wenzhong succeeded in writing a number of important works throughout the decade. Joe was at the peak of his musical career when a crucial door reopened in his life, China. He had not returned to China since he had left for the United States in 1946. Then, in 1972, following President Nixon's historical visit to China, Joe made his first trip back after 25 years. In 1977, he made a landmark visit to the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing. He also met with artists, scholars, and cultural leaders to discuss the idea of creating a non-government program of arts exchange between the two countries. Within a year, Joe had established the Center for U.S.-China Arts Exchange, based at Columbia University. With initial funding from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Ford and Luce Foundations, the Center launched a program which for 40 years has brought together specialists from all fields of the visual and performing arts. The first project, was to organize a visit to China for violinist Isaac Stern. The result was the Oscar-winning documentary From Mao to Mozart. The exchange worked in both directions. Scores of Chinese artists were invited to the United States, the first being playwright Cao Yu. In the 1990s, the center began a multi-year program in Yunnan province with support from the Ford Foundation. The program was aimed at preserving the cultural heritage of Yunnan's many indigenous groups and protecting the rich ecological diversity of the region. The center's aim was to plant good seeds to create relationships that would grow into ongoing exchanges into the future. Its programs have had a major impact on individuals and organizations in the arts on both sides of the globe. From the time Joe joined Columbia University, he devoted most of his time to teaching and administration. For almost two decades, he was unable to find the time to create music of his own. When he retired from teaching, he was finally able to return to the life of an artist. 
he composed a rich collection of new works. His revival began with a bang. Echoes from the Gorge, a quartet for percussion, has been described as Joe's magnum opus, representing a summation of all the concepts he has developed throughout his career. It was followed quickly by Windswept Peaks, which he dedicated to the Chinese intellectuals of that era. Creativity continued to flow. In 1996, he wrote his first string quartet, also known as Clouds. The title Clouds refers to the quality shared by cloud formations and calligraphy, the continual process of change. As a composer, I think I'm different from the majority of them. Uh, I don't just sit down and compose, I get an idea to compose. I'm very much aware, not only of technical, theoretical, aesthetic questions, but uh, in terms of what someone like me should do. I did not think I should write music just for fun, just for myself, or just for player, performers who like to do it. Um, I didn't want to repeat myself. I felt my job, it's not that I felt I had the responsibility, it's just I want to do that. My job is to, as much as I could, as a modern person, to look back at the Chinese heritage and really ask the question, does it deserve to continue? We, my ancestors gave it up by the end of 19th century. Should I? as want to be a composer, take that up first? Or should I follow Western tradition, write a piece that everybody likes, or you want to express your own musical language? I felt my responsibility is that to build my ideas, my career, my pro products on the basis of how to revive the Chinese heritage and in, in view of the, uh, the time lag, to merge with modern ideas. Now in the ninth decade of his life, Zhou Wenzhong observes that his creative work has come full circle. His earliest piece, Landscapes, was written in 1949 for Western Orchestra. 70 years later, he has composed his most recent works for traditional Asian ensembles. Eternal Pine 1 is written for the Korean Kaya Gum Ensemble. Eternal Pine 3 is the first work he has ever composed for a Chinese ensemble. In Chinese culture, the ancient pine tree, bent and gnarled by the winds, is a symbol of longevity and endurance. To Zhou Wenzhong, it represents the tenacious Chinese Wenren withstanding all storms to carry out his mission. He is a link to the future of our shared culture. <laughs>